I'm a user researcher. I work for the Home Office, um, and before that, I worked at the Government Digital Service, or GDS. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about some research heresies. And why I'm going to talk to you about that is because I think there are a bunch of ways that we think about research um, that have been conditioned into us, beliefs that we have about research, that are kind of getting in the way of progressing as research. And as the com conference topic today is um, advancing research, I think we're that kind of audience that can talk about this stuff. Um, so that's what I'm going to do today. And before I get started with that, I really want to talk just briefly about who I am and where I'm coming at this from, so you know how to judge what I'm going to say. Uh, the first thing you need to know about me is that I'm pretty much obsessed with impact. Um, and that comes because, frankly, I've been quite disappointed at the amount of impact that my research and design has had throughout my career, uh, and that irks me. Um, and so I'm just kind of obsessed with impact. Um, what that also means, though, is that I'm kind of more interested in um, impact than I am necessarily in improving the research we do. Like, I think our research is actually pretty strong. Um, where we should be putting our effort is thinking about how we can be more impactful. The second thing is that um, I'm really like a product team type person, right? So I'm a user researcher who really likes to work in multidisciplinary teams, um, and I work with user researchers who work in multidisciplinary teams. And so that's kind of a focus for how I'm going to talk about stuff today. And the third thing is that I'm a lead user researcher. So uh, Kate was talking earlier about um, research leadership, um, and I'm just going to own it, even though it makes me uncomfortable. I'm a research leader, and what that means is I spend a lot of time thinking about how to train and coach and support user researchers so that they can do a better job. And speaking of that... This is where it doesn't work. It has worked. Uh, these are some of the lovely user researchers, wonderful user researchers, that I've um, had the pleasure of working with over the past three years uh, that have been in my teams. And the thing about these, and some of them are in the audience today, um, and the thing about these researchers is that when I'm thinking about how do I explain to them like, what the job of a user researcher is, what is user research, what's the point of it, I'm not really leaning over their shoulder and trying to help them write their discussion guides or helping them moderate sessions or helping them do their analysis, partly because there's too many of them, um, but also partly because that's not really a good way to help them learn. What I'm really interested in doing is explaining what the, what the point of research is or what the point of being a user researcher is so they can then take that away themselves and just flourish on their own and learn on their own and, and get better on their own. The trouble with trying to explain that kind of stuff to people is that it kind of exposes how you don't really know what you thought you knew yourself, right? So over the last two or three years, these people have challenged me in ways that have made me think, actually, there's a bunch of stuff that I thought I knew about research that turns out not to be true. And so I've changed the way I talk about research, and, and that's really what I want to share with you today. I'm going to talk about three different research heresies, you know, different ways that I think about research, um, that are really how I talk to these people about what it is to do our job. And that kind of approach to finding better explanations leads me on to this, which is a really interesting book by David Deutsch, who's a theoretical physicist. And he's got this theory that human knowledge doesn't advance by data and facts and evidence and what he would call empiricism, um, but that actually human knowledge advances through us coming up with better explanations to make sense of the data, the facts, the knowledge. Um, and that the act of explaining things is fundamentally a creative act. Um, it's not an analytical act. Um, and so from that very lofty position, I am going to try and do some of that for us today. The first piece of dogma, which Danny has preempted for me, um, is this. Right? I think this is an unhelpful belief. User needs is an important concept for training user researchers. I think this is unhelpful. I do not agree with this. I get where it comes from. This is one of the places it comes from. This is the first government design principle, start with user needs. This has been really important in government. I love this principle. It's brought a lot of user-centered design to government. It's been a rallying call for researchers and designers to come and work in government, me included. Right? I work in government partly because of this. But when I work with the user researchers on, on our teams, I've come to the conclusion that this is actually a really harmful concept for training researchers and teaching researchers like what the job of being a researcher is. And I know this is quite a big statement, so I want to explain how I've come to this conclusion. This is me joining GDS. 
leaving CX Partners, which is an agency that I work for. And you can see I'm excited because there's a nice exclamation mark. <laughs> but what you can't see in the tweet is that I'm actually really nervous and slightly scared. And the reason I'm nervous and scared is that in my job description and in the job ad and on the service manual and in my objectives when I arrive at GDS is this concept of user needs. And the truth is I don't really understand how to relate user needs to my work, even though I've been a user-centered designer and a user researcher for five years at this point. I can't connect these things. And I kind of feel like this is my personal failing, right? Because everyone's talking about this thing. And I'm like, well, it must be me. And so I hide it like every uh, imposter does. And then gradually, as I'm at GDS, I realize that no, it's not just me. Lots of other researchers, some like very senior researchers on my teams, are also really struggling with what this means. And it's not just them either, it's also designers and product managers. And so this concept of user needs is not as obvious and straightforward as it looks, even at GDS, where we talk about it all the time. And this intrigues me. I like to find explanations for things. And so I'm digging into what's going on. And really, there's two interpretations of user needs. The first interpretation, which was held by um, a lot of the senior researchers that came before me at GDS, so people like Lisa Reichelt, Pete Gale, John Waterworth, Caroline Jarrett, is that user needs is just shorthand, right? User needs is just shorthand and a catch-all phrase to mean all of this stuff. And this stuff is the legitimate object of user research and user-centered design. And I strongly agree with this. We're interested in people's goals, where they are, how they behave, how they feel, the kind of things they do, what they think, what the model of the world is, what problems they're having. Like, this is rich stuff that can help us design better services for people. And that's fine for these senior researchers because a lot of these people have been working in the industry for decades, right? A lot of them were at Flow back in the early 2000s, user-centered design agency, and they just know that their job is to do this. The trouble is there's a whole new generation of researchers and designers coming into government who didn't work at Flow back in the early 2000s, and they're not clear that their job is to do this. And they infer a different meaning. And so they look at things like this. This is all over government, right? You, you, any like, government laptop, this thing's going to be on it if you're in the research and design community. And people look at this, and they think, there's a kind of object in this. There's like a magical object called a user need. And our job is to find these objects. It's almost like they're, they're specimens, and we're trying to hunt them down, and we're trying to put them in collections like they're butterflies with pins through them. And it... <laughs> Right? And that then leads to some secondary weird behavior, which is that um, they start to think, OK, we need a way to like, make these uniform. And so just like Linnaeus with his binomial classification for plants and animals, they're like, right, let's write them all as user stories. So now we've got these objects to be collected. And you know what a user story is. Like, as a conference presenter, I need to have a provocative title so that Danny will accept my talk. Right? <laughs> We know this format, right? and, and that's a great format now, but it's really problematic when we're using the same format to describe user needs, which is like the people side of the problem, and it's the problem space, and our user stories, which is the technology side and the solution space, and it leads to confusing behaviors, like you see teams thinking that they need a user need written in the format of a user story for every single design feature that they're building. They go around chasing user needs for buttons. They go around chasing user needs for particular blocks of text or labels or things in their architecture. And that is a waste of time as a user researcher. That is not what we're here to do. And at the most extreme, you find people gathering these long lists of user needs. And then they think, oh, you know what? We should have a database of them all. And if we have a database of them all, we can capture them all. And then we can do any design we want off the basis of this user needs. It doesn't really work like that. The other problem with this is that when you try and put these things, which are the legitimate object of user-centered design and user research, into the format of a user need, written as a user story, they don't all really work. Goals works, tasks work. But a context, a behavior, an emotion, a belief, a mental model, like these things resist being squashed into this format. You can do it, but you lose a lot of the richness that is there in these things if we let them breathe on their own. And if we're really honest, how many of these things are needs? Is a belief a need? Is a context a need? These things are not all needs. We're doing ourselves a disservice. We're reducing 
the breadth and the complexity of the thing that we're trying to look at by stuffing them into this rigid, narrow concept. And it kind of makes our approach to design a bit reductive and a bit deterministic. Like as if we collect them all, we can do design. So I just don't really talk about user needs with our researchers. I kind of consider it to be basically unhelpful jargon. Um, instead, I would much rather talk about what are our users' goals? What tasks are they doing? What are their behaviors? What are they feeling? All of that rich stuff. Because that stuff gives us a picture of humans using things that allows our product teams and our designers to come up with much better solutions. And that's really what we're here for. OK. Unhelpful belief number two. This one's a lot more personal for me, because I've done this for my entire career. We kind of think that releasing things without user research is unacceptable. And I now strongly disagree with this. And I need to explain that. I'm going to have to talk you through a little bit of a theory about how I think research matures in an organization. So when you start off, and when I started off in an organization, this is what I would find. No, we don't need to do research. We've got this. We've got the requirements. Look at them. We're going to build something. Look at it. And I would shout from the sidelines, you shouldn't have released that without research. It was a mistake. And it was a mistake. And because I did that very convincingly, they'd be like, all right, fine, Will. Let's test some things that we build. And I'd be like, yes, we're doing some research here. But very quickly, you're like, well, maybe that massive architectural decision that you spent six months building, maybe we could have prototyped that first and made some like, prototype tests beforehand. Or maybe this whole proposition. Maybe we could have done some depth interviews to understand whether people even have this problem beforehand. And I'm convincing of that as well, right? So we get to another place, which is a lovely place to be, <laughs> which is, um, right, let's use research for everything. And I got there at GDS, right? Um, one of the wonderful things about working at GDS is if you're reasonably convincing as a researcher, you're going to get this permission to do research right across the product lifecycle. But there's a trap here, and I fell straight into this trap. And the trap is that if you are used to being someone that shouts that everything needs research, then when you're given the opportunity to do research on anything, you suddenly end up trying to do research on too many things. Not just the web pages, but the help pages, the APIs, the documentation, the call center, the like, walk-in center, like the manuals that you give your staff when they do induction. Now, all of those things can be researched, but if you've got this attitude that you should research it all, then you end up trying to do all of it. And what happens when you try and do that much? your quality plummets because you're stretched and you're trying to do too many things and you end up blocking your team. And so what then happens is your team lose their faith in you as a researcher and you've got every chance that you're going to go back to number one on this scale. If you're really lucky, you spot this before that happens, which is that you cannot research everything. You cannot look at everything that is there and try and research it. And you have to make some kind of decision about Let's research the stuff that really matters. Which leads to this. This is the way we should be thinking about user research in a mature organization. Releasing things without research is actually highly desirable a lot of the time. And it's highly desirable because by doing that, by saying these things, go, go, release, release, that gives us time to focus on these things that are important and do enough rigor and enough effort to come back with results that matter on the stuff that's important. But that also means that we need to be mature as individuals and not moan about the stuff that our teams are doing without research, which is not something that researchers are very good at. How do you get there? This is Katie Taylor. you just seen Katie Taylor. You know who Katie Taylor is. Um, we used to work together at GDS. And I would um, spend ages, like, talking about existential research topics with Katie. I'd be like, oh, what is a user need? What is truth? What is research? Uh, um, and after a while, Katie was just like, oh, Will, come on. It's just simple. User research is just about reducing risk. That's all it is. And she was basically saying that to shut me up. But it's kind of profound. Um, and actually, this one sentence that she said to me has completely changed how I think about research. And I'll, I'll show how that, that happens in a sec. But I also want to just like, divert at this point and say, this approach, where you talk about user research as being about reducing risk rather than about user needs, rather than about improving lives, rather than about any other way we frame it, this research is the one that I have found works with extremely senior people. So when I went into the home office, 
there was a lot of skepticism about the research that we were doing, not because of Katie, Katie's done an amazing job there, but because um, we would kind of spread ourselves thin in the way that I've just described. Um, and I was able to bring those really senior skeptical stakeholders round by describing what we were doing as reducing the risk that their investment decisions would go bad. And that is something that those people listen to quite easily. Anyway, risk in research is about finding out what the riskiest assumptions are, right? So you can look at your product. You can look at the backlog of stuff that you've got coming up to build. You can look at the roadmap for what you think you're going to do over the next year. You can look at your whole strategy and your proposition. And you can pull out the assumptions in there and then work out which of those assumptions, if they turn out to be untrue, are going to screw you. And that's basically what we should be researching. We should be only spending our valuable, expensive human research time on the stuff that is the riskiest in our product and letting the rest go. So this is your kind of way into getting out of that thing of we need to research everything before it's released. The other thing that I have a strong hunch will help us here Awardly maps, and I'm not going to have the um, time to really talk you through awardly map today. I tried it. It doesn't fit into 20 minutes. Um, Danny told me it wouldn't. He was right. Um, but really, awardly map is a way of trying to rep Can I just actually show of hands? Who has heard of awardly map? Okay. So awardly map is about representing a service from top to bottom, breaking it up into a bunch of different technologies, and then distributing those technologies or capabilities across this x-axis from Genesis, where it's nerds in a room making technology, to custom built, where it's basically an agile team building that stuff for yourself that no one else is building, to product, where you're getting something off the shelf, like Salesforce or like Shopify, and you're using that in your business, to commodity, which is something that is so known, so solved, that nobody even makes a markup on selling it, and you can only do it at scale, like you know, electricity or water. There's a whole thing about worldly maps, but the thing for research is, I don't think you need to do research on commodities, right? And so I would stick some things in there, like um, payment, right? The way that we know how to do online payment, not everyone does it, right? But we know how to do it. I don't want to see my researchers doing online payments. Or checkouts, even. We kind of know how to do checkouts. I got asked to do research when I was at an agency onto checkouts, and it just had no impact, because checkouts have kind of stabilized. They're a known problem. The other side, Genesis, where it's nerds in a room making technology. Again, not much user research there, because not much users over there. They're making tech. The place we should be focusing is the stuff in the middle, the stuff we're custom building, extremely high value to have research, and the stuff that we're buying off the shelf. We can use research to understand, like Georgia was saying, which things to buy, but also how to customize them. So I'm not going to talk any more about worldly maps, um, but the, th the theme of the conference is advancing research. I think we could do a lot worse than understanding a little bit more about worldly maps as designers and researchers. That's a little diversion. Really what I'm saying is when I talk to our researchers, I make it really clear their job is not to research everything, that their job is to understand what matters, research that well, and then be mature enough to let the rest of it go without moaning about our team and demoralizing them. The last one, number three. I've done a lot of this as well, right? This belief that our job is to make clear recommendations. I did this a lot in agency world. I worked for agencies for five years. And um, you know, if you Google usability agency, you get this kind of stuff on their sites today, right? These are just sites off the first page of Google. Robust, detailed recommendations, actionable recommendations, recommendations for improvement. It's fine for agencies to do this. It's part of the business model. You're not going to go to a client and not tell them what to do after they spent you know, thousands of pounds with you. We don't do this in product teams. User researchers don't make recommendations. And the reason that we don't make recommendations in product teams has to do with the way research relates to design. So let's imagine that you come up with four findings what researcher ever restricts it to four findings, but let's, let's go with that for now. You come up with four findings, A, B, C, and D. If you're thinking about recommendations, you're like, right, oh, four findings, four, four, uh, four recommendations. There's one for A, there's one for B. Does design work like this? No, design does not work like this, because for example, A, there might be three possible ways to solve that. You won't know which one is the right way to solve it or the best way to solve it until you prototype and iterate or until you build, measure, learn, or you do those kind of things that we do to understand but the point is, you can't know what to recommend until you've done that. You don't know that at the point of making the recommendation. Or B, C, and D, maybe there's one intervention that solves all of them. Again, how can you know that at the point of the finding? You can't. It takes someone to go away and do that work, 
And who does that work? It's not us, it's designers. <laughs> this is Stephen. Like this is Stephen. <laughs> this is a very specific designer um, who I used to work with at GDS. Um, he's a great designer. If I give Stephen a bunch of recommendations, two things are going to happen. First, he's not going to do a great job because, as I've just talked about, I'll have constrained his thinking in unhelpful ways. And secondly, he's basically going to dislike me because I've stepped on his toes. Because a recommendation is nothing other than a design solution in camouflage. If, on the other hand, I stop one short of recommendations and I spend my valuable time thinking about what's the best way to explain what I've seen about the way users behave or the way users think. What's the explanation that I can put on that? Then he's going to do a great job because then I've set him up to understand the context in which he's doing his design. And that brings us full circle back to David Deutsch because I think this is what researchers are trying to do. We are trying to provide the explanations that allow the rest of our teams, the product managers, the designers, the developers, the tech arcs, all those people who love solutions, right? You know they love solutions. We're trying to provide the explanation that lets them free on the solution. And so that's the final thing that I say to the researchers that I work with, is I don't want to see recommendations from you. I want you to think about the bit that's the explanation, and I want you to free your colleagues to think about the bit that's the solution. So I said I'd talk to you about some useful heresies. I've talked about three. User needs is a harmful concept for training user researchers. It's confusing. It leads to bad practice. We should be more specific about what we're talking about, things like tasks and goals and behaviors. This mindset that we should adopt, that releasing things without user research is often desirable because it gives us the space that we need and the headspace that we need to work out what's important and do a really good job on that. But it comes with the obligation to be mature enough not to moan about the things our team do without us. And the third one, the simplest one, that we don't make recommendations because that encourages us to be better explainers of what we're seeing and frees our designer colleagues. And I'll end with this, right? We're here to talk about advancing research. Sometimes there's a belief among researchers that advancing research is about finding more advanced research methods, right? That's our comfort spot. I don't think advancing research is about that at all. As I've already said, I think we know enough about research to come back with good results. Advancing research is about finding ways to make our researchers more powerful and our research more impactful. These things will do those for you. I'd love to see you give it a try. Thank you. <laughs>